was part of a group from the Sloan Foundation for about a decade thinking about what we could do to enable people to work longer with the idea that um, Social Security was going to go bankrupt in the United States and retirement needed to be um, extended to older and older ages. And for a long time, we thought the solution was working longer. And then as we neared the end of our discussion, we suddenly thought, well, is this the only solution? And is this the correct solution? And we started to realize, what about all the people who've dropped out of the labor force in their 50s, in their early 60s, in their 40s? Surely raising retirement from 65 to 75 wasn't going to impact them at all. They were already out of the labor force. And those people tend not to be counted um, because they aren't exactly unemployed and they're not fully retired. So we don't have a very good grip on that. And we started to explore this, and it turns out that a huge amount of the workforce, the potential workforce, is actually unemployed or not working full time in their 50s for any number of reasons. So we went back, and instead of thinking that the only solution was working longer, we thought, well, what would we have to do to have a creative, healthy workforce that would be able to work longer, and who wouldn't be able to um, work longer and needed financial security. So that was the beginning, the beginning of the book. Most people don't want to extend um, retirement age. Most people would like it to be 65 and then would like the option, or even earlier and would like the option. But more importantly, what we discovered is that there is enormous heterogeneity in both the health of the workforce, in their responsibilities, in terms of caregiving, and in the kinds of jobs they have. So for people in precarious jobs or very physically demanding jobs, it simply isn't possible to work longer. And they need a viable, <clears throat> secure financial future that um, needs to come to them when it's time to come to them. And for those of us who can work longer um, and get pleasure out of working longer and derive meaning, then that option is a wonderful one and should be extended. But as we decided and confronted the problem, what we really came up with is the idea that labor policy is actually retirement policy. And that as we think about what are good jobs or what retirement policy is, it all depends upon keeping people um, able to work in their mid-career, a decade earlier, before we ever thought about it. If we have um, people who are working in their 50s, then we need to be able to keep them working. And in order to do that, we need two things, or three things to happen. One is people need to be healthy, and some of the data in the United States suggests that um, middle-aged people today are not as healthy as the people, the generation before. And so they may be more vulnerable. They certainly have more caregiving responsibilities as they are dual career couples and as both men and women are in the labor force. And third, the nature of work has changed. So the very jobs that people have have changed over time with less schedule control, not very much worker voice in decision making. And so good jobs, and this is where the labor policy comes in, turns out to be really essential to having people continuing to work. So we ended up, um, after all of this, um, with a number of authors contributing um, really important points and a number of comparative studies looking at countries within um, Europe um, with a couple of policies. One set of them has to do with retirement and financial security and what we can do, and we can talk about that for a bit. And the other set of policies has to do with the nature of work itself and what makes a, a good job. Um, in terms of retirement policies, one of the things that we've suggested in the United States is that instead of extending retirement to make um, Social Security solvent, there are other ways to make Social Security solvent. One of them is raising the cap on um, the contributions of very wealthy people. So right now there's a cap, and if we raise that cap and make contributions at the high end, um, a larger percentage, 
that would solve some of the solvency problem, but that we shouldn't be thinking about um, retirement to save Social Security. We should think about how Social Security can save people um, in this. And there are several approaches to retirement. Once you think that, oh, if the issue is solvency for Social Security, there are a number of solutions. The second thing that we thought about, um, and this has been um, discussed by a number of people, is that retirement or pensions should travel with an individual as they change jobs. Right now in the United States, if people change jobs, they're often at risk of losing the savings that would have gone into their pension. And many other countries have a much more portable or national system um, that allows people to save, in addition to Social Security, their pensions during this time. So having a portable, um, a portable pension kind of a system where there are contributions by both employers and individuals, but that it travels with an individual as they change jobs. Because right now, people change jobs and change firms multiple times, much more than they had in the past. So that becomes really important. And the second, um, or the third thing, has to do with disability. And here, there's, um, there's not clear evidence about exactly the right path, but the idea is that right now, in order to be on disability benefits in the United States, you basically stop working and can't be able to work. But if we had a disability system that was more flexible and allowed people to work some amount of time and receive some disability, they may be able to work longer part-time. So on the retirement side, there are a number of policies that are effective solutions. On the work side, on the good, good job side, there are also a number of solutions. Um, when we think about workplace redesign, one of the things that we've come up with consistently, especially for low, lower and middle wage workers, is that um, schedule control is an increasingly important thing. Um, people work both overtime and under time and very <clears throat> unscheduled jobs and sometimes quite precarious. And so if you ask um, low and middle wage workers what they want, they want more schedule control um, in addition to you know, wa better wages and that sort of thing. So schedule control we think is a very, very important part of how labor policy ought to be practiced and of course um, the United States lags behind most other countries in terms of having uh, paid sickness absence, parental leave, um, any, any one of those kinds of um, federally kind of mandated programs that would enable people to balance between taking care of people, whether they're older or younger, um, and remaining in the labor force. So there are a set of characteristics of good jobs that we think are really important that would enable people to work longer. So that's a really important point and we've actually thought about it. Um, and I would say right now, we're not quite sure how all the technology plays out, but we do have a chapter in the book on, on technology and um, automation. And the point um, that was made um, in the chapter, and also historically, is that since the Industrial Revolution, we have had technology and evolution in this regard, and usually it hasn't um, resulted in people losing jobs. Usually it's resulted in making work easier, um, making work more efficient, you know, decreasing the ratio of physical labor to um, kind of uh, more, you know, kind of, uh, thinking behavior or cognitive sort of skills. And so right now, when you look at the ways in which technology has played out, so far it has basically helped people um, to do jobs better. Whether it will ultimately replace people, like in the warehouse industry, where you know that's probably one of the best examples where it looks like industrialization um, or automation could um, actually replace jobs. So far it hasn't enormously replaced jobs. It may, but it seems to open another door every time one of them gets closed. So technological development certainly has um, a generational component where um, you know, younger people are much more comfortable with a whole set of not only current technologies, but learning to adapt and change and learn 
learn new technologies. Older people seem um, sometimes resistant because it seems like a, a bigger divide um, to conquer that. Um, and so that may be one of the things that is actually a challenge. But again, one of the responses that we have thought about is lifelong learning, that nobody stays in a job today where they're equipped to take it through the next 40 years. Um, if you're a car mechanic and you're 20 years old, what you're going to do when you're 60 years old in terms of the same job is going to be different. Um, and it's true whether you're a doctor um, or a car mechanic. You are going to have to learn new skills all the way along. So if we increase skills training all through the life course and lifelong learning, um, people would better adapt to new jobs and new technological evolutions as they came along. Well, there certainly is discrimination. There's no doubt about that. There's lots of studies on age discrimination, race, ethnicity, gender um, discrimination. And some of it is unconscious. Some of it is quite conscious. Um, sometimes older people earn so much more that it's easier to replace them with a younger person who's earning less. Um, however, the evidence often is that mixed teams um, seem to be really important and that older workers bring to the table or to the unit um, a certain kind of skill and some of it is social, some of it is soft skills. It's negotiating, it's mediating, it's uh, making the team work effectively um, for it. So hopefully over time there won't be so much um, discrimination um, in terms of that. But in general, um, especially in the United States where the private sector is very strong and right now the federal um, possibility for legislating this is very weak, we think that we absolutely must involve the private sector in decision making. And when we do that, we think about who are the employers right now who seem to be most open to this. And often, they're um, employers who are really concerned about the workforce to some extent. They're always concerned about the bottom line. They're businesses, after all. They are concerned about the bottom line. But part of our theory is that what's good for workers is actually often good for the bottom line. Now, it won't always be true. I mean, a lot of like um, environmental regulations were put in place because it wasn't good for the bottom line, and it was more expensive to do that regulation, but they were good um, things for workers. Um, in this case, we often find that workplace redesign is something that businesses think about quite comfortably. They always do workplace redesign. The question is, what do they do it for? Is it for just productivity, or is it for also worker well-being? And then ultimately, in our experience, that what motivates employers sometimes to come and ask for this kind of workplace redesign is that they're very concerned about turnover um, and losing their most valuable workers, especially in low and middle wage sectors where people are in a competitive environment and they can go to another job, um, especially right now. Um, and the other is absenteeism um, and sickness absence where people just call out. We see in the health sector, it's an enormous expense to the health sector to have people um, nurses and nursing assistants call out in the morning when honestly they knew they were going to be out anyway. And if they could plan better um, and be honest about it, they would, it would be both good for the worker and good for the bottom line. I think, I think the most important thing that we can offer is evidence that scientists, whether they're in economics or sociology or epidemiology or whatever, bring an evidence base. And often um, employers have a sense of what works, but they don't actually know what works. And this is a relatively new field. When we think about workplace redesign, it's not like we absolutely know the right thing to do. So evaluating workplace practices to see if they're good for the worker um, and good for the business and have this dual strategy is very, very important. And I think what, what researchers do is offer the opportunity to bring evidence to bear on this. Mm -hmm.